all of the planets uh, are in a solar system that revolve around the sun. The sun is central, has the most density, it's the biggest, it's the biggest thing. All other planets, regardless of how big other planets are, they pale in comparison compared to the sun. If it wasn't for the sun, we wouldn't have life. Uh, so that means the sun is not only central for these planets to kind of exist, but central for our lives as well, for us to exist. Now, what if one of those planets decided to just kind of do its own thing, get out of the orbits and just kind of go somewhere else? Well, not only would that be bad for that planet, let's say that was our planet, we would all die, that would be a bad thing, um, but also the, all the rest of the other planets would get messed up as well. There is this system, the solar system is a system that works together, that revolves around and, and because of gravity is connected together. Because a planet got wrong what was central by doing its own thing, by going off and not revolving around the sun, by that planet getting something wrong, it messed up the whole system. And it really only takes one planet. Now, the same idea is true of our own lives. What we see as central, what we see as primary, as what matters most, is important. What is first in our lives will direct all the other parts of our lives. If money is first, that changes how we view people, that changes how we view where we live. If family is first, that changes how we view money, that changes how we live, all those kind of things. Whatever is central first is going to change everything else. And God here is trying to get us to see what the most important things are so that our whole system can avoid kind of getting messed up and being all off track. And also so that we can, met, we can live as we were meant to be. We're just humans that are fully alive. Not halfway alive, not kind of stumbling through life, but humans who are fully alive. But with that, we do have a problem. And that problem comes in two ways. One, if, if we don't have that right central thing to revolve around, that's a problem. Uh, the second one is maybe we have the right thing, but we just don't do it. Both of those are issues. We have a problem choosing for ourselves the best way to live. The Bible talks about this a lot. Uh, there's this awesome and gruesome book in the Old Testament called Judges. Have you guys ever read Judges before? It is a horror story. It's amazing. I love it. It's so good. Um, but it's, it's a tra a one train wreck after another, and they just get worse and worse and worse. Judges about what everyone's doing, like the, the phrase that come, comes up, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone's trying to do what's right, but it ends up horror and horror, like literal dismemberment, really bad amazingly fun and good stuff. Doing what seems right to us is a horror story. When we as humans tend to do what we do is sell ourselves short. We find smaller lives, we find smaller stories, inferior stories to live by, and we eke out an existence, and then we just kind of try and be content with getting by. That is not humans fully alive. God has something more for us. And thankfully, God knows about all those shortcomings even more than we do. And what Jesus does is he saves us from those inferior stories and rescues us to his story. So he saves us from the small-mindedness that we have when we think of doing things right in our own eyes and saves us to this great, big, grand story. For Christians, the center of everything is Jesus. And we know we don't always live that way, but that's what we aspire to, that's what we work for, that's what we start new churches for. So we're going to look at how God is telling us about a central story, a central event, and the central power. So to kind of organize how we're going to look at these verses, that idea of revolving around what is most important, a central story, a central event, and a central power. So let's give this first eight verses. We're going to look at the gospel, which is the central story. God, through Paul's writing, uh, tells us in verse 1, he wants to remind us of the gospel. Now, I would remind you, brothers, by the way, look at the size of this Bible. I, we normally preach out of an NIV, um, and so I had to find an ESV. This is my wife's ESV Bible. And I think that the size of the Bible is kind of like directly related to the inadequacy of the preacher. So I don't know what this is. Um, apologies to anyone else who has massive Bibles and has preached before me. I just threw everybody under the bus probably. <laughs> I threw everybody under the bus. Um, that's okay, I'm out of here after this, so yeah. No. So this is uh, in verse 1. Uh, he tells us uh, that he wants to remind us of the gospel. And he's not writing to people who don't know about the gospel. He's writing to the church, the Christians. He's telling Christians, you need to be reminded. Who needs to be reminded of things? people who forget stuff. We forget it. God wants us to remind us of the gospel through Paul. And Paul tells us what the gospel is. I'm just going to read verses 3 for 8. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. 
The gospel is the good news that God himself, Christ, the king, died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again to appear to us. Now that's something, I know you guys hear that every week because you're a gospel-driven church. You're gospel, you preach the gospel all the time. But I wonder if the amount of times we hear it undoes the insanity of it all, the majesty of it all, the, the miracleness of it. This should not be true. This is completely unfair. And yet this is what we get. Paul wants to remind us of the gospel because it's, as he says, of first importance. For I delivered to you what was a first important thing that he also received. So if it's first important for Paul and first important for the church at Corinth, it's going to be first important for us who are following in those footsteps. It's central. It's primary. So the gospel is the central story. We will either miss it by not believing that, or we do say we believe it but don't really act like it. And that's if it doesn't really get in deep. And maybe we need to hear this again because even as I just said, it hasn't gotten down deep. We go through the, if going through the gospel, it's a message, it's a story that we have dignity, that we broke it, and that God moved heaven and hell to restore it. That's an amazing thing. This story is so good to organize our lives around any other story means that we miss out. We're, we're shooting too low. Also, if the gospel is the first story in our lives, it's going to direct all the other stories. So if you want to love your neighbor, the thing you have to get right is the story of the gospel. And we're going to talk about how that might connect a little bit later. If you want to love your kids well, if you want to raise them well, the first thing you have to get is the story of the gospel. If you want to care for your parents well, the first thing you have to get is the story of the gospel. Paul tells us this is the message through which we are being saved if we hold firmly to it. Now, saved is a present, a past, and a future reality. It's a, a, uh, if you are saved, you are saved from the past, from sin's penalty. No longer are we headed towards death. We're headed to, towards life. We actually have life through God himself. It's, uh, if you are saved, it's a present reality. We're given a new heart. So now the, the, uh, the power of sin doesn't, doesn't control us. And it's also a future reality because we get saved to the new world, the new heavens and earth that, we, that we're working towards. Now, of course, there are other stories that we organize our lives around. We know that. Uh, we might believe that in life, it's up to us to sort us out. And there can be very Christian versions of this, right? We wouldn't say you need to figure it out and sort yourself out, but kind of we do in Christian-y kind of ways sometimes. The religious versions are, I must always be trying harder. And if you aren't, you should feel really guilty. What, you don't read your Bible two hours every single day by yourself in silence and then pray for two hours after that? Mm. There are also non-religious versions of that. To have a good life, I need to do good. I need to like, be impressive for somebody else. Or I need to be busy. Everyone's busy. Everyone, how are you doing? You say you're busy. I say it probably more than anyone else. How are you? I'm busy. That's not a how you're doing. That's like a what you're doing. How you're bu- No one has to be busy, yet we all are. There's something about that. There's something about that. I think we're missing what really the gospel might say to us. It leads to our burnout culture. Everybody's burnt out. We long for things that we just can't reach. And so we do more of the same. We try this thing, maybe buy this house, try these pills, read this book. These things might work for a bit, but eventually they're going to stop giving us what we need. So we get bored and we try something else. Maybe start a family. Maybe train for another job. Look, all of those kinds of stories are just far too small. You can be 100% amazing at any of those stories, and you're never going to get the thing that you want because you can't shove God into those things. There's so much in here that longs for something more. Nothing we can fully grasp or understand will ever fulfill us. Yet those are the things we go after because we want to be able to contain it. So you can have control if you want. You're just going to miss out on life. You can get control. You're just going to miss out on life. The Bible says we have eternity set in our hearts, but not in a way that we can figure it out by ourselves. That can, I, that can be tragic or it can be amazing. Now, once you've tried all that for a bit, that kind of more burnout culture kind of stuff, it's easy to slide into the second story that we organize ourselves around, and that's basically nothing really matters. Nothing really matters. Just try and make it. I've tried to kind of, you know, get what I could out of a family or a career or out of friendships or, you know, kids or whatever the thing is, and I got a little bit, but it wasn't a lot, so I'm just going to kind of be okay with the status quo. That can look like middle class. That can look like working class. It doesn't really matter. It's basically a resignation in life. That hope is nothing more than a, like a cruel trick. The gospel, this is, this is just too good to be true. That's like fairy tale stuff. The best life is an escape from life. 
sofa, binge-watching holidays, just dreaming about any of those things. What a sad existence when we organize our existence trying to avoid our existence. And that's making it. But the gospel is a story that not only enlarges our world, it enlarges our hearts, and it gives us a bigger and a better story and allows us to fulfill them as well. We're enabled to live it out through what Jesus has done. So how does that happen? Well, that gets to the second point here. How in the world does this happen? So if the cross is the central, or the um, gospel is the central story, there's a central event in that central story, and that's the cross and the resurrection. The central story has a central event, the cross and the resurrection. Now, maybe you're thinking, is he bad at maths? He just mentioned two when he was talking singular. And I am bad at maths, um, and it is two events, but just kind of go with me here, because really the two are so intertwined, they can really be seen as one event. So we're going to take a bit of time to look at the central event in all of history. All of history's central event is the cross and the resurrection. The cross first. In verse 3, we're told, Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. I mean, is there any phrase so often repeated by the church, so often overlooked and so amazingly, mind-blowingly big? Jesus died for our sins. That should be like a record scratch moment. You know when like someone walks into a room and like a film and all the people are hanging out, they're all chatting and he walks like, everyone stops. Like, that's weird. And the guy like slowly kind of moves back to where the thing was. That should be the record scratch. Jesus died for our sins. Wait, what? Hold, hold on, hold on. Jesus, he's God, right? Yeah. And what did we do to deserve this? Nothing. And he died for us? Yeah. Why? Because he loves us. But did we do anything to deserve that love? No, he, he did it because he loves and that's what he is, his love. What? That's insane. That, that is insane. That's insanity. I understand. I completely understand why people would think the Bible and Jesus and all that is a fairy tale because it sounds too good to be true. That sounds impossible. So someone died for our sins. No less Jesus Christ, God himself, died for our sins. And this is crazy stuff. Now, if you've been around this church, I know you've heard this before, but don't let the repetition of amazingly good news undo its reality and wonder. It's amazingly good news. And Paul tells us that after Jesus' death, he was raised from the dead, just as the Bible has said the whole time. He didn't just hang out by himself, Jesus. He saw Cephas, who's Peter, and then the rest of the disciples, more than 500 men and women at the same time. Now, some of these people have died. Some of them are still alive. So that the original audience, the people here at the church of Corinth, could go back and actually talk to these people who saw Jesus. There's, like, there's a reason why these people are mentioned. Also, there's a reason why all those really long um, kind of... Uh, um, in the beginning of the Gospels, all these things talking about this person begat that person begat that person, so people could go back and actually see these are real people. Now, it may not be enjoyable to read. I totally get that. No one enjoys reading the genealogies. But there's a reason why it's there. It's because it actually happens in real life. It's real time and place. Now, some of those people died. Some of them are alive. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the other apostles, and lastly, to Paul. So many, many people saw Jesus die. That's not a question. Of, it's not a historical fact issue. Many, many people saw Jesus in his resurrected body. Now, we might not understand the science behind that, but historically speaking, it's not really, it's not an issue there. The data, all the data we have, very good data, says that Jesus died and he rose again. We may not understand that, but that's at least the data that we have. In fact, all the closest historical documents attest to this. You think something that sounds so ridiculous will be so easily, like, proven against, especially when we have all sorts of documents that are around there. But as 2,000 years, nearly, as time has gone by, everything that we unearth, using archaeology and historical practices, everything that we unearth has done nothing but to bolster the original message that's been there. If it's not true, all, we would get a lot more documents, and we have documents of that time, that would at least kind of pull some of that into question, but it's just, that's just not the truth. Historically speaking, this is an actual real event. Now, people might class Jesus' death and resurrection in that category of fake news. But if anyone spends any time looking at the actual facts, one has to come to terms with the cross and resurrection being a real historical event. And any other position then turns out to be fake news. And I want to live my life according to reality, not according to like, you know, what some guy on YouTube said. Now, why am I going on about that? Well, why does the cross and resurrection matter so much? Is it really the central event in all of history? Well, here's the deal. None of what we talked about today so far and we'll talk about, none of what we sang about today, none of what you experienced today really matters unless Jesus died and rose again. If he didn't, it might be nice, but it's just a nice Sunday out. The gospel story isn't just kind of 
fanci some fanciful tale, but it is that the cross and resurrection didn't happen. Jesus makes that gospel true through the cross and resurrection. So that's a central story of the gospel. Jesus made it come true through the cross and the resurrection. And with the cross, all the brokenness that we are born into, all the brokenness that others have inflicted upon us, all the brokenness that we inflict on other people, Jesus took that with him to the cross. The brokenness that prevents us from knowing ourselves truly, from knowing other people, from, from knowing God, Jesus took all of that, he put it on his back, and through his death, put all of it to death. Now, the cross without the resurrection only gets us so far. We can only kind of get to like a middle neutral ground without the resurrection, being neutral. But Jesus doesn't stop there. His resurrection kind of tips the scales over from neutral into positive. So we're freed to be humans as we were really meant to be, humans fully alive. And when we follow Jesus, God gives us that new heart that we talked about. We're made as new people. We're a new creation. And this is only possible through history's biggest event, Jesus' death and resurrection. And the cross didn't just make something potentially happen. The cross made it happen. That's a really big difference. Was the cross a potential for something maybe to happen in the future, or was there something that happened on the cross? What we're reading here is something actually happened on the cross. Is where those things are accomplished, where Jesus won. He didn't potentially win. He won. And the cross and resurrection is where Jesus, he sees the script that we're writing for our lives. And on our own, we don't really do so well. I mean, have you ever taken a history course? Have you ever seen any documentary film ever? Humans, basically, we're the worst. We're the worst things ever. There's a, I use this quote all the time. I probably overly use it. Um, I'm a massive Seinfeld fan. I grew up, that's like my family's love language is Seinfeld. Uh, I know they didn't make it to, like globally the way that Friends did, but in my, in, in my head and in my heart, Seinfeld is far more superior to Friends. If you like Friends, that's cool. I'm sorry, you're wrong. But Seinfeld, there's a great quote from Seinfeld that I always use, which is like, oh, people, they're the worst. And it's true. We are. We are the worst. Any documentary you ever see, it's like, that guy's a killer. This guy, maybe he's a killer. If not, like, I don't know, he probably should be in prison anyway for all these other horrible things he's done. Man's history, we're not great. So the cross and resurrection event is when Jesus, who's the author and script writer himself, enters onto the stage where he takes the bad we've accumulated and he takes responsibility for it. It costs him his life. Then not only does he remove all the bad, but he gives us all the good, the most unequal exchange ever. We give him all our bad stuff, he takes it, and then he gives us all his good stuff. Now Jesus being God, he's got a lot of good stuff. In fact, one might say he has an infinite supply of good stuff. And so he has given all of that. Ephesians 1.3 says, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing through Jesus. Every spiritual blessing. Some of the blessings? No, every single one. I think Jesus has a lot of spiritual blessings, and that's what we get. As he writes his story into our lives, he tells us to take it, take hold of it firmly. Now this kind of thing from a God is what you need when you're, the life preserver you need when you're on those oceans of anxiety. This is the rescue boat you've been calling for when drowning in those waters of overwhelm, when you can't get to sleep at night. It is his hand reaching out in those chaotic storms. The cross and the resurrection is nothing less than God himself moving heaven and hell so that you will be with him. It, it, it's too good, and it's true. Now, with that, sometimes we get, I think, a little bit mixed up. I know I do. I think you're probably like me in this, too. And if you've been around the church for a while, you, you've probably heard all the stuff that I said before. And you might be nodding along. Yes, yep, this is good news. This is great. And you might be feeling it's great. But we tend to get a few things mixed up. So let's make it clear here. What was put to death? Our sin on Jesus. Was our happiness put to death? No. Was our boldness put to death? No. Was our joy of life kind of put to death? Was our fun, like, outlook on life put to death? None of that. Sin brings death into this world, our ultimate death, and all the little deaths that we inflict upon other people. That's a scary thing, but through the cross and the resurrection, that has been put to death. Nothing else has. And who was raised to life? Jesus was raised to life. Were our sins raised to life? No. Was our punishments, were those raised to life? Nope. Those are in the ground. Our guilt, our shame, what we've done in the past, only Jesus was raised from that cross. Everything else 
six feet under. And sometimes what we do is we try and raise what's already been put to death. And we try and keep dead what's actually been raised to life. Let me explain a little bit. When at night, maybe, or when you're alone by yourself, and you have those thoughts of what you've done in the past, you know, you can probably instantly recall some of those things, and you torture yourself over it. Do not try and resurrect the punishment that Jesus has already taken on. Before God himself, and that's a judge, before God himself, you have no guilt, you have no shame, you have no brokenness anymore, and he delights in you. He isn't just kind of like, ugh, I guess Danny's got to come along. Um, uh, I wish he'd just get his stuff together. No, he, he loves being able to interact with you. He delights in you. If you're taken over by shame, by guilt, know that shame and guilt have been put to death on the cross, destroyed forever, never to rise again, keeping on in a sin over and over and over again, like an addiction. If you follow Jesus, you get to be freed from that. Now, talk to someone if you need help from that. This is not something you can do on your own. All of this, by the way, is written to the church. These are all plural stuff. We, when he says you, he's not saying you individually. He's saying you all. So this is not something that you are equipped to be able to do yourself. You have to talk to somebody else. But let's not attempt to resurrect what Jesus has already put to death. And let's take the other side. We try and keep dead what Jesus has raised to life. Through Jesus' resurrection, we're, we're, free. We're, we're free to be bold. If you read the, the, uh, the Acts of the Apostles and they're saying crazy things, they're getting persecuted and, like, and beat down and they're happy about it. Like That doesn't make any sense unless they've been free to be able to be bold in that way. And how often do we try and keep that boldness dead within us? Because it just might lead to an awkward conversation. We don't even engage in the awkwardness. We're so afraid of the awkwardness, we're like a step or maybe like two steps removed. That's going to be really strange. What are they going to think about it? You know, we're, we're not going to talk about Jesus maybe in the ways that we ought to because that awkwardness block. But the boldness for the church in the book of Acts meant sharing their lives with people, people beyond their own cultural boundaries. Sometimes that meant people came to faith. Sometimes that meant people hated them. But they were bold. And here's how it works out with us, I think. That fear of awkwardness becomes most important instead of that new life inside of us. But that fear of awkwardness, that, that's in the ground. That's, that's part of the dead part of you. If I get into this conversation with someone right now, it might be awkward, so I'm not going to bring up Jesus where I should. So let's get these truths the right way around. Do not try and resurrect your sin. Do not try and resurrect the punishment for your sin. Do not try and resurrect all the shame and identity issues that come with your sin. Don't try and keep dead the new life Jesus has given you. And if you haven't been able to take hold of that, Maybe uh, you're investigating Jesus and his church. Maybe there's parts, there's parts of all of our hearts that don't want to be a part of that. Maybe that's skeptical even. Is that even a good kind of life for me to live? Just know that anyone can get in on that. Jesus invites everyone to move closer to him. Now for all of us, let's take firmly of how Jesus moved heaven and hell so that his new life would break into a world full of brokenness and death. Now maybe at this point you've thought about uh, where you don't measure up. Uh, maybe talking about how our shame is put to death means like you're just thinking about shame the whole time or thinking about guilt the whole time. Like, yeah, you know that one sin that keeps you up at night and then the, the, from there, I've just been... And then like, that sin is kind of replaying over and over and over again. Maybe you're saying, I'm not good enough and probably never will be, but you know what? That is a true statement. That's true for everybody. It's true for everyone. We're not going to be good enough, ever. So the gospel is a central story the cross and the resurrection is a central event. But now we come to the next thing. If those things are true, how do we go about it? How do we, like, what enables us to live in that way? Because that sounds really good, but to be honest, it, minus this last thing, that's just idealism that will kill us. If it's in our own power, we already know we're not going to be good enough. Let's just be honest with that. I did say anyone can get in on this, but how do we get in on this? A good deal surely requires, like, a big price, right? Well, thankfully, God gives us this new way to live, which is called grace. Grace is a central power for those who follow Jesus. So we have the central story, the central event, and then now the central power that allows us to walk and work through those things. Look, God knows you don't have enough in your account to pay for this. That's the whole reason he came to earth anyway. He knows how broke you are. He knows better than you do how skint your soul really is. He doesn't require you to pay. Why would he? He's got it all anyway. He's not like trying to add to his own coffers. He's already paid. Grace is only for those who don't deserve it. So if you think you deserve it, I'm sorry, it's not for you. You can find something else, a hobby maybe. 
Grace is God has paid it and you get it. And this is how Paul describes it in his life. He says he's the least. When I think about Paul, I think of a rock star Christian like knocking down doors and planting churches and traveling and like shipwrecks. And I mean, that, that's the rock star kind of Christian life, right? But he's the least. He doesn't deserve to be called an apostle. Why is that? Well, because Paul was in charge of persecuting and even killing people who followed Jesus. You think he had some sins that kept him up at night? Of course he did. Jesus came to Paul. Paul did not come to him. Paul was doing everything he could to destroy the work of Jesus and his followers. And only God could use someone so ironic to write the majority of our New Testament. So if you think you have some guilt and shame, you probably don't have as much as Paul had going into this. From destroying God's people to leading them and ultimately surrendering and being destroyed himself for this God that he sought to destroy. So Paul did not deserve grace. Paul the rock star, he's amazing. And he did get to do some amazing things. But why did Paul get to do these things? How did he do it? Well, let's look at verse 10 really quickly, because this is something that when I read it, I was like, oh, I think that does make sense. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any, any of them. Is this Paul trying to big up himself against the other apostles? What's going on here? Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Anything amazing that Paul did was God's grace. That's amazing. And the same is true of our lives. Our central power, what gives energy to our lives, is God's grace. Here is one way to tell the evidence of God's grace in your life, that you work hard. Now, that can get mixed up. If one happens before the other, then it's all messed up. But if God's grace is working in your life, that enables you to be able to work hard in a way you wouldn't be able to otherwise. It's all about the order. God's grace then our work, the order of operations, make a difference between a delightful Christian life and crushing legalism that is not Christian in any way. So God's grace, then our work. If God's grace, then our work. If God's giving us everything we need in Jesus, everything, then that frees us to work in ways that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. It stops us also from chasing down those rabbit holes that are kind of these inferior stories that steal the time and energy away from us anyway. Sometimes uh, there's an idea that relying on God's grace in our lives leaves us in like a state of bliss and we kind of like slowly levitate in the air as we are like the, reaching this Christian version of nirvana. Oh, I'm really in God's grace now because nothing can go wrong. I'm not bothered. Like that is not Paul's life. Paul's life was difficult. It was rough. He was working hard. He's involved in people's lives. That was not, wasn't true of Jesus' life either. Jesus was involved in people's lives. People basically... I can't believe he didn't lose it for people not getting it over and over and over again, especially his own disciples. See, our job is to not... Here's the thing. The Christian life is about reflecting the new heavens and earth in our life now. Heaven is not here yet, but we get to reflect those realities. Our job is to join God in the remaking of this world, for Stockport to reflect more of heaven than it does now. That's why you're here. And that takes a lot of work. Have you guys ever tried doing that? Of course you have. You're part of a church. There's a little bit of work in that, right? Just a little bit, maybe, every now and then. And if we make grace our central power, we'll be able to join him in that work, and not just like for a Sunday or two, but for the long haul, for years, for decades. To the extent that we grasp that God's grace is our central power, we can join him in his mission of making this world new. To the extent that we get that, how much, we get, how much of God's grace we get, that's the level we can join him in, in his mission that he has for us. See, grace is what the apostles preached, what the early church believed, is what we continue to preach and what we continue to believe. It's our central power. And it's kind of like the difference between running on batteries and being plugged into the mains. With a battery, you can go on for a while, maybe a long while if the batteries are really powerful, but eventually they're going to run out. Sooner or later, batteries go dead. Now, not so when you're plugged into the mains. As long as that plug is in the socket, the blender, the drill, the coffee maker, whatever, it'll go on forever, or as long as you can afford to pay for it, especially now. But here's the other thing. With a battery, you don't need to be connected to anything. You can do whatever you want. You can go wherever you want. You're cordless. You're free to do whatever. So you can have freedom. With something that has to be plugged in, it has a cable, it does limit freedom. So you can have complete freedom if you want. You, you can. Everybody can. You can do everything on your own terms in your own way. It's just that that battery is going to run out. In this life, yes, and in the next one. 
But if you want to have a central power that never goes off, you can have that one too. A power that keeps going when you can't because it's something from beyond you. It's something from beyond even just mere human community. It's a supernatural power from God himself. It's not the something you work for. It's something that's given. And yes, it will require you to sacrifice some of your toxic individuality. It will. And that won't feel good, but it is good. It is good because there's life to be found. And in this life and when we die, and it never runs out. Now, if you have that kind of power, it should be used. If you're plugged in, you're going to be used. You're going to say you're a, let's continue this metaphor in a way that I did not intend. Uh, let's continue that you're a coffee grinder. If you had a coffee grinder plugged in and never used it, eventually you don't need it anymore. But if you're plugged in, the expectation is I'm going to use it all the time. See, our central power is God's grace, and that allows us to work. When we reverse that order of our work first, then God's grace, that's what gets us into all those of trouble, and that is anti-Christian in every possible way. When we rely on our own strength and use God for a top-up, that doesn't go well either. And when it doesn't go well, what we do is say, oh, God, why? Why is my life so difficult? Why are things so hard? It's not God's fault you didn't rely on him. And that, that's what we do. It's complaining that the blender is broken, broken when we haven't even plugged it in. And this is what leads us to continue in our selfishness, in our pride, in our lack of love for each other, in not speaking the gospel to others, in our self-righteousness, in our religiosity. A lack of grace leads to a church that kind of feels like a downer. It's just not fun to be around that. A church should feel like a party, like what we had when we first started. That's what, a ch that's what a church is, where everyone's welcomed, a warm family where everyone is invited, and there's great food, especially chicken wings, on the table. This can only happen if we start with God's grace. It's our central power, after all. And how can we tell if we're making grace our central power? Really, two main words. And it's very basic. I, I'm sorry, it's nothing amazing and, and fantastic and like glorious. Although it is glorious, but it's not maybe something crazy. It's the Bible and prayer. Listening to his words and speaking our words back to him. When we listen to God, and every time we open this up, he has words for us to say, or us to hear. Every time we open this up, God opens his mouth. When we listen to God, we get to hear the voice of grace. And we need that because that voice doesn't come within us. We're not built in with that voice. It comes from him. And a relationship with God is one where he speaks and we listen. What would it be like to say, you know, I really like you. I just don't like you when you talk. That would be hard. Well, I mean, if one spouse did that to another, I think you have to like move out of the way. So a slap would be coming towards you at some point. I love you. I just, can you not talk ever? That's exactly what we do if we don't read the Bible. We're not letting God talk. We keep his, his mouth shut. We should crave his words of grace to us. We really need it, really, if we think about it. But even when we don't feel it, we still read it because we know the truth is that words of grace come from the God of grace. And it goes the other way as well. Prayer is talking to God. When we talk to God, we tell him how we need him, how far we might feel from him, how much we don't want to be talking to him right now, our desire um, for others to know him. Uh, really, we need God to be God and to do things only he can do. As a church, we've been called to an impossible task by ourselves. And if we don't talk to God about where we need him to come through for us, we shouldn't expect there to really be any change. He invites us to talk to him about this. If it's a relationship, we speak. We listen and we speak. Now, maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you've never read a verse in the Bible before. When you did it, was something really weird. didn't make any sense. Maybe you've never tried to pray before. When you did it, it was just kind of this weird kind of thing and just felt like nothing really happened or you didn't know what to say. But let me tell you all, all the things that we talked about today... Anyone can get in on this. That is kind of scandalous. Anybody, regardless of where you are ethically, where you are status in the world wise, any, anyone can get in on this. Now, you might need someone to help you through that because you may not be able to do it by yourself. In fact, you probably won't be able to do it by yourself. But here's the truth for all of us, all of us today, and we've done it already and we will continue to do it. You can talk with the Lord of the universe. Have you ever read, um, there's a, a name for God called like the um, God of hosts, Lord of hosts. I remember reading that growing up and I had no idea what, what that meant. Like, I don't know, is it like some kind of, is he hosting you? Is it platters of something? I'm not sure what the deal is. But uh, the message translation puts it really well. The God of angel armies. The God who has like an innumerable amount of, of legions of angels. He can dispatch it any kind of way that he wants to. That's the God we get to talk to whenever. And he wants us to do it. I don't get it. I don't get it. So if you want to stop living a life off a battery that's nearly dead, you can. 
All of us have heard God's words here in 1 Corinthians. What are we going to do about it? How will we respond? How will this be something beyond just kind of listening to something that might be kind of interesting, maybe sort of, and, but have it be a part of our lives? Well, I think one thing is that Christian maturity is growing more dependent on God to come through in ways that we can't. Instead of trying to grow in independence, as we might do in maybe like our earthly lives, Christian maturity is growing more in dependence. And two primary ways we do that is listening to God's word and speaking to him in prayer. Now, maybe that feels a bit ho-hum. Oh, big surprise, a preacher's telling me to read my Bible more and pray more. Like, I, never, I didn't see that one coming. Oh, my gosh, where do you come up with that one? But here's the thing about the Christian life. It's gloriously simple. It is not rocket science. You just can do it. You just read the things, and you just talk. What? That's the Christian life. That's, that's crazy. Beware of people touting like this. One weird trick will get you close to God. Beware of that. Because a Christian life is a very simple thing. As simple as wine and bread are. That's what the Christian life is. Thankfully, God gives us his grace that we need. And he asks us to respond in very simple and attainable ways. He doesn't ask beyond what we can do. So we've looked at how the gospel is a central story. How the cross and resurrection is a central event. And how grace is is the central power. Now, the more we lean into these truths, the more we, like planets, revolve around the Lord and stop trying to be our own little solar systems. If the earth spun off, tried to be its own thing, all life would die. We get life from revolving around the sun. The same is true of our spiritual lives. We get our life from revolving around Jesus, God's son. And without it, life within us withers and dies. And the only way we can even imagine, to begin to do any of this is because Jesus has already given it all to us. He's already given all that he has by dying on the cross for us. Through his death, our sin has been put to death, and Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose again. Through his life, he now gives us everything we need. Everything we need, he has. Everything we need, he has. So let's continue to make this gospel the central story in our lives and in other people's lives. As we continue to see that cross and resurrection as a central event, not just in generic history, but in our own history. And let's continue to make grace a central power in our lives instead of whatever else we're trying to run off of. Let's continue to rely on the God of grace as our central power for all that we need in life.